Well, good afternoon. Pleasure to uh, be here and to share the program with two of my uh, good friends. Here are some uh, uh, potential conflicts of interest. And here are uh, my disclosures, uh, research projects, speaking engagements, consulting fees, etc. Uh, I assure you I will try to uh, uh, give uh, uh, honest uh, mention and honest mention of the data and not be influenced by other organizations that have helped support me in my work over the years. So here are the topics I propose to cover in the next 50 or 60 minutes. You got that, Chip? Put your 60 minutes? We thought it was funny. <laughs> I didn't have to say they're not listening to me. They never listen to me, they're just sitting there in the days. Uh, I, I, I put these uh, in uh, a little earlier this afternoon, uh, the, the talks that I've heard already at this meeting, uh, many excellent talks, and although we're focusing on physical activity and exercise, uh, I do believe that there is such a thing as a healthy diet. I'm not quite sure we know what it is, but maybe so. But here's uh, some research that uh, Marianne Hero did with us a few years ago. She got her PhD just down the road. Uh, Queen's University with uh, Bob Ross, and uh, I think the bottom bullet here is stuff that I heard, the kind of thing I heard repeated a good bit uh, the, the, this morning and in, in the earlier sessions. So uh, Mary Ann then looked at fitness in relation to those unhealthy eating indices. So here we are, the, go back there. Uh, <clears throat> You could, uh, I think, maybe go. Yeah, through. I've got a better pointer. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the low level of unhealthy eating, moderate, and high level of unhealthy. And then these are the low, moderate, and high fitness. And you can see, okay, there's probably a bit of a trend there for the unhealthy eating index. I don't really see much of anything here in the high fit. Maybe there's uh, something here in the, in the uh, low fit. The point of this slide is, Fitness is a heck of a lot more important than diet. You got that, all you nutritionists? Now, we, we heard a lot of good background uh, uh, this morning on you know, diabetes and factors affecting diabetes. And everyone in the room knows far more than I do about these mechanisms, the physiologic mechanisms, biochemical mechanisms. But I do think there are several ways in which physical inactivity can affect this pathway. And note that I do say, so, well, there are some other factors that we do always need to keep in mind. Uh, I want to go back, and this is already mentioned, uh, the Finnish study already mentioned uh, this morning at least once. So you're all familiar with these data. You know that those in the intervention group did better over time. But the thing I really liked about the Finnish study, see, you know, the weight loss, okay, that's good for you. But even if they didn't lose weight, whether they were in either group, they did a whole lot better if they were physically active. Okay, I'm biased. I admit it. Uh, but my topic was to be fitness and uh, diabetes. I'll start with a report from our colleague Susumu Sawada um, that studied the Tokyo Gas Company over the past uh, many years. Uh, so there, this is one of the relatively few big databases that has an exercise test, so measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. It's a submaximal test, but still that's uh, at least a laboratory measure, and you can all read uh, the other items on the slide. So here are the main findings, low, moderate, and high fitness, and BMI. My God, they've really got a lot of fat people there in that Tokyo Gas Company, don't they? Look at this high category, BMI 23.7. Uh, here, this uh, still even a bit of trend in these tiny, skinny Japanese guys, but certainly a trend here and here across fitness categories. 
uh, one of our reports published now several years ago, this in uh, a group of women in the aerobic center longitudinal study, per max maximal met by one max met unit on a treadmill test. Well, you guys are nutritionists. You know what a max met is? One met resting metabolic rate. Uh, so two mets double rest. Okay. So you see, uh, this is a pretty steep trend. Look at the difference. Five. Well, fourfold difference in diabetes across these increments of fitness in this group of women. So I was debating uh, Professor Aimeen Lee, uh, an outstanding uh, scientist at Harvard University at the American Heart Association on this crazy fitness fatness concept that we came up with 20 some years ago. Presented the first research on that, in fact, just over there in Quebec City. I'm a really stupid guy. I was presenting it at an obesity meeting. And I said, forget about obesity, it's a fitness. What a lot of rubbish that is! I heard. So, but anyway, as debating I'm in that fitness is far more important than fatness, and fitness tends to eliminate the association of fatness with health. And she, I was winning, of course, you can imagine. <laughs> but then she nailed me. She said, well, Steve, you might be right for all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease, but you're not right for diabetes. I'll show that woman. So I went back and told my postdoc, D.C. Lee, okay, let's do this fit fat in the diet. And oh my God, she was right. Here in the fit guys, if they were uh, higher fat, yeah, they did have an increased risk. So I did, of course, invite I'm in to help us interpret these results and, and publish this report. I mean, I still will claim, I think this slide also supports, fitness probably is more important than fatness. And remember, this is measured fatness in the lab. This isn't BMI. But uh, okay, for diabetes risk of incident diabetes, fatness is a factor, no question. Uh, a couple of people, at least this morning, mentioned the look ahead study and uh, I don't think anyone showed this slide, but uh, over the course of the trial, uh, this group fell off of it, but they were still uh, more fit after four years of follow-up than those in the, uh, <clears throat> well, control group. Uh, John Jakizik sent me this slide the other day, published a couple of years ago. So this is the uh, diabetes support and education and the intensive lifestyle group. So in both groups combined across Decline in fitness, 0 to 10 percent. Well, you can all read. Uh, so across fitness groups, also in the uh, diabetes and support and education group, and in the intensive lifestyle, again, fitness is important in reducing the risk of uh, developing diabetes. So let's get to fitness and mortality. First paper we published on this now 15 years ago, uh, follow up again of a group of men, uh, all of whom had physician diagnosed type 2 diabetes at baseline by either uh, of, of those measured. So followed up for several years, 180 deaths over that time. And when, when Ming showed me the data, I said, oh yeah, boy, look at that, fitness is, and it's actually a lot more important. Now obesity, uh, or a, a BMI is associated. You know, this is not, I mean, that's, there's a bit of a trend there. But I mean, look at that, 60% lower risk, 80% lower risk. He said, oh my goodness, that looks pretty powerful. But does that apply when you consider other health risk factors? So this is another slide from that paper, whether it's again, we've already seen the BMI data, uh, blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking status, uh, baseline fitness or not, a family history, and whether they have diabetes. You know, in all these cases, fitness does seem to be important. So then, uh, a couple of years after that, uh, young Tim had joined us, uh, well, a few years before then, and so Tim decided to look at uh, fitness, fatness, and mortality. And at that time, we had almost 2,200 men with type 2 diabetes, again defined as, as such, 275 deaths during the follow-up period. Uh, here's how the finding from that study. These are the curves of the guys who were at least moderately fit. And these were the guys unfit 
And the way we've been defining it over the years, unfit, <clears throat> excuse me, is the bottom 20% of each age, gender, category. So these are not marathon runners. They're just out of the bottom 20%. And we've called them moderate or high fit. And you can see the fit curves, whether the person is overweight or uh, obese or normal weight, uh, the fit guys were less likely to die. The unfit guys were more likely to die. Uh, whether they had uh, a high BMI or not. Then he followed that up. We got a few more cardiovascular disease deaths. <clears throat> I've shown this slide to him a thousand times around the world. It's one of my favorites. Uh, so again, these men with diabetes, 179 cardiovascular disease deaths during follow-up. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how it is here in Canada or in Norway or wherever you're, you're from, but I can tell you, in the United States, it is impossible to escape the doctor's office without, having, without getting weighed. I try every time. I say, well, you don't need to weigh. Come on, fat boy, get on that scale. <laughs> so they're going to weigh you, measure your height, and calculate your BMI. You cannot escape without getting your BMI calculated. So here in the normal, by BMI standards, low, moderate, and high fit, Look at this risk of cardiovascular disease. In the overweight, now there aren't a lot of obese guys who are high fit. If you put your imagination to work and think about it, there is one in this room. <laughs> so Tim, because of, as we do in epidemiology, not enough in the high fit category. So combine the moderate and high fit, so they're at least moderately fit, and look at that difference in risk of cardiovascular disease death. In fact, look at the difference here. In the fat guys who are at least moderately fit, who have diabetes, and compare that risk to these guys who are normal weight and unfit. Is it possible, in Norway, for example, can you escape a medical visit without having an exercise test and your fitness measure? Yeah. Is that true in every single country? In the United States, what percentage of medical exams include a fitness diet? I don't know, but you could count the percent on, well, maybe, well, it's not very many. You can't get out without having this done. What's important here? If you have a patient with diabetes and you want to know their risk, of dying in the next few years, what's important, BMI or fitness? You can all read. Uh, Paul McCauley, uh, a little bit after uh, Tim's uh, work, uh, followed a different population. Now, you, some of you may know the Cooper Clinic population that I've worked on all these years. They're mostly uh, non-Hispanic whites. 80-some uh, percent of them have college or graduated from college. They're business executives, lawyers, doctors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so they're and they're quite a lot different from Susan Musawado's uh, Tokyo Gas Company guys, who are all blue-collar Japanese. And you can lay his results uh, right on uh, ours. So I would say the uh, the veterans study that uh, Paul, John Myers, Peter Kakinas have been working with. So that's a pretty different population than the Cooper Clinic population. But I think, if you look here at the survival curves, looks like, uh, yeah, maybe the association's pretty much the same. Whether you're a, 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 a retired U.S. veteran, uh, probably if you're in this study and you go to the veterans for your medical care, you're probably not the business executive or uh, professor or uh, lawyer, doctor, what have you. So then we worked with uh, Paul and uh, recently, just still a little over a year ago, looked in the ACLS database on fitness, fatness, and survival in adults now with, with pre-diabetes. So the men and women in this analysis, you can see these are the uh, 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 factors of this particular study published in Diabetes Care last year. And here are the main results. Kind of a complicated slide and a little hard to see some of these numbers in the back. I apologize for that. But these are the fit men and women. The reference category, of course, the fit, at least moderately fit, a normal weight individuals. Well, there's no difference between the risk 
of, of dying uh, in, uh, across the overweight or obese category. Now there aren't a lot. I mean, I am not the only fat guy, obese guy who is uh, fit, but there are some, and the numbers are smaller, but uh, no elevated risk. And then you look at the unfit ones, and all of these are at higher risk of dying. And the results, again here, we have waist circumference, we have percent body fat measured in the lab, and the results are all pretty much the same. So that's why I think uh, fitness is a very important determinant anytime we discuss diabetes, or in fact almost any health outcome, even including uh, what is this disease that affects stroke? The, no, brain. Brain. Uh, brain. Uh, brain yes. Dementia. Oh, dementia. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll remember that eventually. Yeah. But uh, we have published on well, that. There's well, there's three signs of a dementia. You know, uh, the first is for, for, <laughs> forgetting. <laughs> so, of course, again, I'm biased. Fitness is important for just about anything. Uh, so, how should we deal with the diabetes? Obviously, I think we need a lot of focus on activity, because what is fitness? It's just a marker of what your physical activity is. And to get out of the low fit category that I've been discussing, what do you suppose you have to do? 150 minutes a week, moderate intensity activity, etc. You don't have to run marathons or compete in uh, uh, triathlons like Dr. Church uh, does, or at least has, has done. Uh, but get that 150 minutes a week. So how do we get people to do that? We do need to understand energy balance much better than we do. I know probably most of you are from the nutrition field. I respect nutrition, but there's far more emphasis on nutrition than there is on activity for any health outcome. I think the distinguished uh, person, the lady who opened the talk this morning, uh, she, she, she went on and on about sugar and did he, she mentioned fast foods, et cetera. So that's what we're bombarded with out there in the mass media and go to PubMed and search physical inactivity and obesity, diet and obesity. You will see many fold difference. I'm going to see more balance on energy balance. Then <clears throat> I want us to design interventions to address these problems of healthy eating and physical activity at the population level. She mentioned this, why, why am I picking on her? Uh, that uh, well, let's uh, put menu, the, on the menu, let's require restaurants to put the calories. I'm, I'm not opposed to letting people, that, that, I think that's fine. When New York City did that, she mentioned Mayor Bloomberg, do you know what happened, at least to the research I've seen, do you know what happened to caloric intake after that? It went up in New York City. They work in the wrong direction. So let's test these things, the public policy education programs. Let's see what works. And you want me to tell you the solution to the world's non-communicable chronic disease problems? Learn how to use modern technology to help people practice healthful lifestyle. There will never be enough doctors, nurses, dietitians, exercise, never be enough. But we have learned about behavior change. We have learned some of the things that work. Let's apply them with modern technology. And this is a new area of research that we've got a big center at, uh, at, at our in institution. So, of course, I'm keen on that. And then let's implement these successful interventions. And finally, back to energy balance, Let's have more balance in science and in uh, media, in meetings like this, etc. So this is a new project, relatively new, the Global Energy Balance Network that uh, Jim Hill and I came up with uh, some months ago. Go to the website, take a look. We're still in early days. Send us advice. Tell us how to improve it. And sign up to be a member. You can do, no cost, no charge. Just sign up to be a member. So, uh, and seriously, uh, we do welcome comments on how we can improve the website and improve. <laughs> and we, we really only want 7.1 billion members. We'll exclude uh, 0.2 billion. 
and uh, and you know, so we we don't want to reach everybody. We do want to reach a lot of people. Help us do that. Thank you.